Well, hello everyone, my name is Tyler. I'm a student in Dr. Andrea Kirkwood's lab at Ontario Tech University. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about investigating the distribution of Nitolopsis obtusa in Ontario Lakes and its role as an ecosystem engineer. So Nitolopsis obtusa, also known as starry stonewort, uh, it gets the common name of starry stonewort from its white star-shaped bubbles, which you can see in panel F here. Um, these bubbles act as asexual reproductive structures and hibernation cells. And despite uh, Nitolopsis looking like an um, aquatic plant, it's actually a macroalga, a part of the Caryophyceae family. Nitolopsis has the highest growth characteristic out of all the Caryophytes, where generally this alga will concentrate its biomass at the sediment water interface, but in environments where it becomes established, uh, it can completely dominate the water column into the surface waters and displace all other macrophytes as well as Eurasian water milfoil, as you can see in panel E there, as well as a mono, uh, monoculture rate collection in, in panel A. Nitolopsis can reproduce both sexually and asexually, and despite initial reports that uh, both males and females were present within Ontario lakes, investigation into these red, tiny red spheres in panel D there. Um, initially, the researchers thought that these were Uugonia. Um, however, there are, in all the samples that were looked at, both within the United States as well as Canada, uh, it turned out that these were male and Theridae. Right now, researchers hypothesize that only males are present within North America due to unfavorable environmental conditions. So Nitolopsis is native to Europe and Asia, stretching from the British Isles all the way through to Japan. Um, throughout this area, it's classified as threatened or critically endangered. And the invaded range uh, within North America encompasses central eastern um, part, but this could be uh, farther widespread, which we'll talk about shortly. So the first documented case of Nitolopsis in North America was in 1978. Uh, although it was first misidentified. At first, researchers thought that this was just a common native Cara species, and researchers from New York uh, went back in the herbarium records and corrected this in 2015, I believe. In 1983, it was documented in the St. Clair Detroit River system, and in 2005, it was becoming recognized in several states. In 2010, uh, reports started to explode throughout the United States, although Canada remained relatively quiet. The first instance of Nitolopsis within Ontario was within, uh, sorry, was in 2015 in Presqu'ile Bay. The current known range for uh, Nitolopsis in North America encompasses seven states and two provinces. So several hypotheses could explain why there are increased reports nearly 40 years after introduction. However, a lot of researchers report not identifying the species correctly at first. This has been attributed to caryophytes and Nitolopsis specifically, um, displaying high degrees of phenotypic plasticity within uh, emerging ecotypes within certain environments where um, the environmental conditions differ from those uh, of the textbook case. So the first instance where confirmed presence of Nitolopsis was documented in an inland Canadian lake was in Lake Scugog. Lake Scugog is a large Mara Lake, a part of the trans Severn Waterway, which is approximately uh, 60 minutes northeast of Toronto. Lake Scugog has been a macrophyte-dominated ecosystem since its creation. Macrophyte-dominated ecosystems are beneficial to species richness. They also help with recruitment of uh, aquatic and terrestrial species, and they maintain habitat heterogeneity to ensure reproductive success for a variety of different species. And even despite invasive species making Lake Scugog their home, uh, this system has stayed a macrophyte dominated system until recently. Uh, and it also used to support a very productive uh, sport fishery for the region. So two prominent invasive species in Lake Scugog previously include Eurasian water milfoil on the left. Uh, this was an invasive macrophyte from Eurasia, and it was also labeled as the most aggressive invasive freshwater uh, systems have ever seen. Although this is turning out not to be true from what we've um, seen it during our studies, and we'll talk about that shortly. Zebra mussels are also now quite prominent within Lake Scugog. Um, it is also an invasive species from Eurasia, uh, a bivalve, 
And until recently, despite zebra mussels being present within Lake Scudog for the past 30 years, the numbers have remained relatively low. So despite these two being present and essentially running rampant, they seem to be the lesser of two evils of the invasive world that could be affecting Canadian freshwater systems in the future. So since the initial identification of Nitalopsis in 2015 and the subsequent increase, we started to witness population collapses throughout the lower aquatic food web. And when this occurred, we saw the emergence of harmful algal blooms that were predominantly dominated by the toxin producing uh, taxa microcystis. So to address these concerning community level shifts, once a month from May to September, over the last four years, we would go to 12 sites distributed across Lake Scugog. These sites were chosen uh, for their proximity to critical fish spawning habitat, as well as uh, significant land use areas. We, when we went to each of these sites over the five month sampling period, we would look at things like water quality and all the communities across the lower aquatic food web. So why is Nitalopsis invasion an issue? With Nitalopsis becoming prominent throughout Lake Sugog, we saw a decrease in species richness in all communities across the lower aquatic food web. This is problematic because species richness is often used as a measure of ecosystem health. And running uh, modeling, various modeling techniques, uh, we started to realize that despite Nitalopsis having negative relationships with most aquatic taxa across the lower aquatic food web, concerning relationships between Nitalopsis, uh, microcystis, and zebra mussels, mussels were starting to emerge. Also, we were starting to understand that there was this very strong negative relationship between Nitalopsis and Eurasian water milkfoil. Earlier on in the four year study period, we would see Nitalopsis grow on Eurasian water milkfoil sort of like an epiphyte until it weighed down into the water column and died. Uh, as Nitalopsis increased and became more dominant, we actually saw it just completely wipe out Eurasian water milkfoil, which could be troubling for um, Canadian freshwater systems in the future. So to start to understand why these harmful algal blooms were emerging, generally we looked at phosphorus. Phosphorus has been long highlighted to be a primary component for emerging microcystis blooms. And however, looking at the historical trends for uh, Lake Scugog in this uh, graph here, we can see a general trend of reduction. Although since 2010, phosphorus concentrations have begun to climb and have consistently surpassed the eutrophic threshold set out by the provincial water quality guidelines. During the 2018 and 2019 sampling period, conditions were considered hypertrophic and uh, maintained that over the entire five months. We're beginning to understand where all this excess phosphorus is coming from, and Nitalopsis is at the center of that. So although legislation and best management practices have resulted in the reduction of phosphorus over the years, legacy phosphorus still persi persists within the sediments. Generally in aquatic ecosystems, when oxygen becomes very low at the sediment water interface, the chemical dynamics of the sediments shift, and this allows the mobilization of phosphorus that was once stored in the sediments to be released back into the water column. Nitalopsis seems to be acting as an ecosystem engineer by decreasing benthic oxygen concentrations, which we can see in the first panel here, A. So sites with Nitalopsis generally had lower uh, benthic oxygen concentrations than those without, and overall, the biomass of Nitalopsis presence drive this relationship, as we can see in uh, the middle panel B here. Nitalopsis also had a very strong uh, relationship with pore water soluble reactive phosphorus being released from the sediment back into the water column, which is quite concerning uh, with the emergence of these microcystis blooms. So despite phosphorus having a history of facilitating microcystis blooms, we wanted to create an ecosystem level model demonstrated um, to demonstrate the driving factors for the emergence of these harmful algal blooms. And looking at this graph here, what we started to realize was, although phosphorus is generally, um, or has been the primary driving factor for the emergence of microcystis blooms, what we're highlighting within Lake Scudog is actually the biotic interactions primarily between Nitalopsis and microcystis are stronger driving factors for the emergence of these blooms within the system. Oops. So despite starting to understand how Nitalopsis can affect our freshwater systems, it still does not address several unanswered questions about the invasion biology within Ontario. 
So the distribution of Mytilopsis within Ontario is still not fully understood. The water quality parameters that either promote or constrain presence of Mytilopsis have yet to be identified, and whether we have uh, unique ecotapes being generated because of unfavorable environmental conditions is yet to be quantified. So to begin to address these gaps in knowledge, uh, we selected 60 lakes for uh, a survey, and these lakes were selected along a geological gradient of calcium. This was done since calcium has been an important component for curified establishment and persistence within lakes, and literature from the United States where this is also becoming a rampant invasive has uh, suggested that calcium is the primary driving factor for invasion within those systems. Uh, we split the calcium range into three sections uh, guided by the research in the United States and in each of these three sections we would have 20 lakes. The range uh, went from 0 0.63 to 69.8 I believe. And so what we would do over a three week period in August, so uh, we chose August because it was supposed to be the highest growth of what we've seen over the last four years. So we went to each of these 60 lakes and we sampled both water quality, environmental conditions, and the macrophyte community. Uh, we did this along a foresight transect from a boat launch, just so we had a defined depth profile, and we also could investigate uh, further suggested transportation mechanisms. So within Ontario, distribution of Nitolopsis seems to be following the Trent Severn waterway. Although Nitolopsis has been documented to expand through Epizucuri, the most probable mode of dispersion within Ontario is through anthropogenic means. Research from the United States has demonstrated that pieces or fragments, even the little tiny stars, uh, the bulbs, these can persist up uh, on boats as well as boating, trailers, or even humans in some case, uh, for up to 10 days. In general, Nitolopsis throughout the study was found closer to boat launches, which indicates further investigation into the anthropogenic transfer mechanisms uh, in Ontario systems. To understand what habitat characteristics promote and constrain Nitolopsis in Ontario, we uh, developed an ecological niche model. And despite calcium being import an important cation for all carophytes and being labeled as the primary driving factor for invasion in the United States, what we found from this ecological niche model was that um, depth as well as other cations, predominantly potassium and magnesium, were better predictors than calcium within our systems. Although calcium was still an important uh, factor for Nitolopsis presence within Ontario, it only um, contributed 5% of uh, ex the explanation power into this model. So the differences between what we're seeing here um, within the Ontario lakes as well as what's emerging from the United States is likely due to the emergence of unique ecotypes. Uh, and again, because Nitolopsis has high degrees of phenotypic plasticity, this is not unexpected. So investigation into these ecotypes present within Ontario is still ongoing. We're currently awaiting sequence data for 160 samples to be returned to us. From this, we can also determine the likely number of introductions, whether it was either one introduction event or if there was uh, several introduction events. And since traditional macrophyte management procedures are very, very unsuccessful in this uh, managing Nitolopsis, um, predominantly in the United States, these ecotypes and a quantification of this might prove useful in the future, especially if we can identify unique microsatellite regions within the uh, genome. So in conclusion, uh, Nitolopsis is much more established in Ontario than previous, previously believed. Distribution is most likely facilitated through recreational activities and boating. Nitolopsis is acting as an ecosystem engineer by ultimate, altering sediment dynamics, facilitating internal loading, decreasing species richness across the lower aquatic food web. Other cations seem to play a larger role in the invasion biology of Nitolopsis over calcium than previous literature assertions. And management opportunities are very poor with current methods, although the identification of ecotypes within Ontario could provide useful in the future. So with that, we'd just like to thank uh, all our colleagues and Kirkwood Lab members and our funding partners and take any questions. Wow, thank you, Taylor. Uh, let's go over to the Q&A and answer a couple of questions. Sure.
Uh, so Vicky asked, what are the unfavorable environmental conditions? Um, predominantly the growth period. So in the native range, you have a lo uh, longer growing season. Um, it's also been suggested that phosphorus is the important. In the native range, you don't really find Nitolopsis growing or even present outside of oligotrophic conditions. Uh, but within the United States, as well as the lakes that we looked at, uh, Nitolopsis is present up to 450 micrograms of phosphorus, and it has no problem whatsoever. Uh, is it foraged in its native range? Yes. So some uh, fish species like tilapia, as well as I think it's the red-breasted duck, um, they they eat Nitolopsis, but nothing in uh, North America currently forages on it. Uh, how have fish been affected in Lake Scuba? Uh, so the sport fishery is essentially non-existent, I want to say. Uh, a moratorium was put in place on the walleye, uh, but what we're starting to see is it's even affecting the panfish, so the bluegill and the perch and stuff. You'll have just a dense benthic mat, it'll go right to the surface, and then you'll just, when we're trying to drive through it, you'll see all these dead uh, fish species. So it's definitely having an effect on uh, fish populations. Uh, what so somebody asked, what part does temperature and the inherent rise and fall of a man-made lake scoop of? Um, so interestingly, temperature did not vary um, from 2016 to 2019. It remained very consistent. Uh, even from May to September every year, um, it only varied like two degrees. Uh, so in the ecological niche model, we had um, 19 initial variables, but that, that was removed almost instantly. So how do you ID Nitolopsis? Um, that's very tricky. It, it, it depends what system you're working in. Um, generally, it will look, some people call it the spaghetti wheat. Uh, if you know what car looks like. So you'll have like no, they're like little circles, they, they're called nodes. And then you'll have your branchlets and whorls from two to eight from those. Um, the difference between this and CAR is the length between the nodes as well as the branches will generally be longer. Uh, if you also have bobles present, you can see the difference in the bobles uh, the easiest. So Nitolopsis always will have the star bobles, where CAR, Nutella, or any other carophyte generally have. It almost looks like a donut with holes in it uh, for their bobles. Okay. That's awesome. Um, I think with that, um, hopefully you'll uh, stick around. I know there's um, lots of questions on this. Yeah. And uh, again, something that's, um, I believe there's a meeting, was a meeting today about this as well of uh, discussing it with the province of Ontario. Unfortunately, we couldn't attend, but um, yeah. we'll be at the table again for the next one. And it's something that we're looking um, or hoping to be able to work with. So. Thank you for your presentation today, Tyler. Thanks for having me.